William, where are you going? Oh, Judy, I'm going camping. Ah, the only camping you need to do is in front of your TV for a new episode of Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. Now we know that a lot of our viewers are actually going to be going out and camping. And you know, before you go out camping, don't forget to take care of your garden and your pets. So on today's show, speaking of further places that you might be visiting, we're going to be talking about plants from Chile. We'll also be giving you tips about summer fuchsia care. But coming up first today, wild rice. Well, I'm standing here with Jeff, who is the owner of the Arrowhead Wild Rice Company. Now, Jeff, I remember it was probably four or five years ago when we came out to these very fields where you are growing this, this wonderful product you grow. So first of all, tell me what it is and why we thought it was so uniquely different to have it here. This is a wild rice, which is native to the Great Lakes region. It's an aquatic grass seed, so not even related to rice. But uh, it, uh, this is the flower on the plant, and this is where the rice actually, that's actually where grows. grows. So, and this is actually, it, am I right in saying it's the only American grain, native the, grain? It is the only native American grain. Wow, wow. North American native right. grain crop. And then, it's, first of all, it's beautiful. This bloom that you showed us, I mean, the color is a nice kind of a purple, purple. thing. And then, how do you know, as, as your fields are filled with this right now. So how do you know, oh, I think it's time to harvest. What does that process go through? Uh, as the seed head matures, because it's still a wild plant, it will mature slowly. So when there's about 60% of good grain on here, that's when you want to try to get in and harvest. But then I would think, because you actually grow this in, like, like rice, there's exactly water like in rice. these fields yes. right now, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. <laughs> So you can't really just go in with your big old harvester and harvest at any time. Tell me what the process is then of how you know when to drain the fields, when to harvest, because that's got to be different every year almost. Yes, especially like this year, it's been a little cooler, so it's taken a little longer. So we kind of watch the majority and try to get an average of the maturity and take a few samples. It's kind of a lot of just a feel for it. And then right, we right. when to drain the rice paddy and then once we drain it, about two weeks, we can go in and with a combine, just a regular combine and combine it. So that's a normal kind of way that you would harvest it over other types of grains like wheat and stuff, is it, it's a combine that whips it down and yep. takes it in. But I have to say, uh, Jeff, if I remember correctly, this, this is not your, your first attempt at farming and agriculture, is it? No, <laughs> no, it is not. This, this ground down here is uh, typically swamp ground. It floods in the wintertime. And we, we grow conventional crops like grass seed and sweet corn down here. And it, it just, it's difficult ground to get in. And so we found wild rice to grow down here and it, it loves it. The worse the ground is, the better off the rice does. So Because the wet doesn't bother it at all. This crop kind of <laughs> picked us. Right. So it could flood down here in the winter and it doesn't bother it. It, it likes it. So... Perfect. And then you also, though, have an entire area right here on, on your farm where you do the processing of this as well to get it ready to sell. Correct. All the way down to edible. Wow, grain. wow. So let's take a little quick break. Let's run up there and go over how, what, what more processing you go through to get this ready to sell. Okay, Jeff, I'm, I'm going to call this the processing room for lack of better words to use to define what you do here. But this is where you bring the harvested grain, the wild rice, and then somehow going through this process, you turn it into this where it is sellable. Tell me how you get from the harvest to this. Well, after we combine it, we uh, bring it up here and we run it through roasters, which is unique to wild rice. And that gives the wild rice a real smoky, nutty flavor that's very unique to just this specific that grain. Thing. Now, I have to ask though, in, in my world, roasting is like, you know, barbecuing chicken, you know, roasting in an oven. Is that a different process when you say you roast it? It's, it's kind of a steam, slow cook type roast 
Okay. And it dry, it helps us because it's 48% moisture when right. we combine it. So it also dries it out to 7%, so it's storable. And then we gotta de-hole it. So there's a little, that little hole on the seed. We gotta take that off and then we length grade it and get the nice long grain and nice. uh, run it across a gravity table, which cleans out like if there's a rock or anything in there and we get it super clean. Wow and send out tests for purity and uh, then it uh, ends and then, up like that. And when that process is done, then you put it into, the, these are your big bags of stuff, yes. but then you also package it in these great little bags for one, retail. One pound bags for retail. And these are available uh, if people go to your website, they can find out, yes. contact you and see where they can actually buy this for their own home use or for restaurants and such. Yep. Wonderful, wonderful. Yep. Well. There you have it. I was fascinated the first time we did this story years ago, and I am still equally fascinated by it. So if you're interested in more information, go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over the web, uh, to their website. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it yes. again. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. Do you have a leaning or broken fence? Fix a broken fence with ease. Made in Oregon, the sturdy fence post bracket can mend your drooping fence. Strong wind, falling debris, dry rot, and wayward drivers can all cause havoc on your once sturdy fence. Our sturdy bracket attaches to your existing fence and is easily installed in 30 minutes. Limit waste, materials, and save money by fixing your existing fence. Purchase online at sturdfence.com or visit participating PAR Lumber and Pro Build stores. Nothing is more inviting than a garden full of beautiful clematis. And your chance to see the Queen of Vines is at the Rogerson Clematis Garden at Lusher Farms. To learn more about the garden, get directions, or learn about garden events, go to rogersonclematiscollection.org. So I'm, I'm greatly delighted to be standing here with Sam from One Green World. And Sam, today we're going to be talking about specific plants because you guys carry such a wonderful, not only of unique plants, but wonderful edible plants. But we're going to be talking about plants that came from Chile, right? Correct. So I'm going to jump right in and I'll, I'll cut in when I have a question or seven. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> So, so tell me about this one, because it looks familiar to me. Yeah, you've probably seen these not at this size, but at gargantuan size all over Portland, because we have 100-year-old specimens all over the place. Uh, and what we call it is the monkey puzzle here right. in North America. In South America, they call it araucaria. Right. And not a lot of people know this, because we often just plant lone specimens. Uh, but they actually produce a really delicious, edible, starchy nut. Really? Yeah. But the thing is, you have to have male and female trees in order to get pollination. And we all grow seedlings here. We don't know what they are. People don't plant enough of them, so we hardly ever get. So you never actually them. get that. And they, they use that in Chile. To this food. day, they still wow. harvest and eat araucaria nuts like crazy. Wow, yeah. interesting, interesting. Yeah, they're a, they're a wonderful plant, but they, they have a spine. I mean, they, they can be pokey. They have a spine, <laughs> but give it 30 years or so, and then the spines will all be And then it'll over be, they'll be up high. <laughs> all right, and you won't perfect. run into them. And what's this one sitting down there? This is a really cute little guy called Chilean guava. And guava oh, is sort of just a yeah. loose term for anything in the myrtle family that makes a good fruit. Um, this is a selection from Jim Gerdeman's garden uh -huh. in Southern Oregon. And they're really sweet little evergreen plants. The flowers smell amazing. We realized this year when they were all in flower, we were like, what is that? And then they make these little, not quite ripe yet fruits. Adorable. And then do, what color do they turn when they're ripe? Uh, it's a more dark red. Dark red. And so, then how big does this shrub get? Do you know? Is this it like one, this particular form usually tops out at three or four feet. Oh, so not a massive I've seen plant them then. in South America get up six, eight, sort of like a high bush blueberry. Right, right. But it tastes pretty small. Wonderful, wonderful. And then uh, there's one down on the ground kind of in the back here. I'll step aside so Jeff can see it. But tell me about this because I'm really intrigued by this plant. This is an elusive and one of our all-time favorite Chilean plants called the Chilean hazelnut. 
and not a true hazelnut. It's actually more closely related to the macadamia nut wow. in the Proteaceae family. Oh, so proteas. Yes. Which are a great florist flower. They're, and the flowers <laughs> on these are amazing too. They use wonderful. the foliage uh, in cut flower arrangements and it's really, really hard to grow. <laughs> and so, you know. <laughs> well, we, okay, at least you're honest about that. Yeah. But if you can grow it then, is the, is the nut then again, what is edible from The nut from is this? amazing on it. Yeah. And, and is there, what, what is the flavor of them? Why, why do they like them? It's, it's got that whole high uh, oil content, kind of like okay. a macadamia okay. nut. Yeah, right, right. And they're really tasty. We might have some we can eat. Oh, in the I, fridge I wouldn't say no to that. We'd be eating some of our seed stock. But so even if they, they, they might be frustrating for, for growers here, you're certainly more than willing when people come in and might to get all the answers for how they can do it best here. Yeah, the porridge has to be just right for right, these ones. Right. Not too hot, not too cold. Right, right soil conditions. <laughs> We've planted this one in the shade of this Luma because it wants this sort of dappled shade, forest uh -huh. edge kind of thing. So once you know what it requires to really work here, you'll be able to share that with everybody then. Correct. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, speaking of this plant, the Luma, tell me about this and what is it that we would eat off of it in Chile? This one is called Luma apiculata, and you can see the little berries just starting to form. Right, right. It's one of the many amazing Chilean myrtles that are down there, and this one, Similar to the Chilean guava, makes a berry. You can even see the resemblance in well, the fruit. Well, it's interesting to me how many of the myrtle family plants, because we can grow myrtles here mm -hmm. in Oregon, how many, especially in Chile, then obviously they use for edible purposes. Yeah, for as edible well. purposes. They make a really delicious wine out of this. Oh, wonderful. And wonderful. people use it as like a cheesecake topping. And wow. This is a clone we found that is particularly hardy. And, and, and thrives right here. Yeah, never a burned leaf on it. Well, you know, every time we come out and chat with Sam about different products that they sell here, we are always delighted to get even more information that we're completely unaware of as well. So if you're thinking, I want to try this stuff, uh, go to gardentime.tv. We'll click over to their website, come out, chat with them, and buy some wonderful, unique Chilean plants for your own garden. Sam, my friend, thank you so much. Thanks for coming out. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. So I talked to some of the people here and they were giving me a pretty, a pretty good deal on trading my truck in. So then I went home and got her and I said, okay, come pick out a Subaru. I felt like the entire process was transparent and that they were really honest and open with us about everything and that made it easier to want to purchase from Capital. I think they want to keep, you know, loyal customers and I never got that from any other dealership. Capital isn't on the parkway, they are the parkway. The fields are in bloom and looking beautiful. We welcome everyone to come visit us here at Swan Island Dahlias. Stop by Swan Island Dahlias in Canby and stroll the 40 acres of blooms. And don't forget the Dahlia Festival the last weekend in August and Labor Day weekend. During the festival, you can see over 400 cut flower displays, enjoy specialty foods, and see flower arranging demonstrations. Swan Island Dahlias is located in Canby, just minutes south of Portland. Come, Come see us. us! A destination farm and garden market featuring the very best each season has to offer. Smith Berry Barn offers seasonal farm fresh fruits and vegetables and specialty herbs and perennials. Visit the historic barn for distinctive gifts, gourmet foods, and homemade milkshakes. Right now we have fresh picked or pick your own berries ready in our fields. Here's what we have to offer this week. Centrally located off of Shoals Ferry Road between Sherwood and Hillsboro, Smith Berry Barn, growing good taste from the ground up. It's a sunny day out today, so Sarah and I have our sunglasses on, but Sarah, inside the greenhouse, it's not too bad. It's okay in here. <laughs> we'll yeah. have a fan. We've got the fans going. <laughs> it's, it's coming down, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we need to talk about fuchsias, because we plant fuchsias in the spring. We get those baskets in the spring, so now it's a little warmer. So what should we be doing with them? Um, definitely, the number one thing for fuchsias is making sure they get enough water. Ah. They, um, they like just tons and tons of water. They need fertilizer. Um, to help and um, something that I like to do with mine is the cocoa blend from um, I that. Yeah. from black gold I, that holds water a little better or you know the cocoa fiber can help um, kind of soak up some of that water uh, for the fuchsia 
And you have some really interesting varieties because, you know, we always see the magenta and the dark pink and purple. Mm -hmm. These are very interesting. Yeah, which, I mean, I love those. I, um, but these are, especially, I think, for hardy fuchsias, are just gorgeous. Um, so this one here is Celia Sm uh, Smedley. And it's got just, I like to call this like the Disney. Oh, I don't know, does. it just reminds me of Disney. A for princess, some reason. Yeah, it? so that shape. Um, and it's a little bit on the upright side, and it would just make a great addition to a garden. Very nice. And then we've got this one back here called Firecracker, which is, I'm assuming from just how it kind of opens up, is like, <laughs> gorgeous. And, um, you know, the long tubes are just a, kind of a different look as well, and it's got that variegated leaf. Now, that one is an annual. All right. Um, so then we've also got Delta Sarah. Ah, and you picked and that one because your name, right? Of course. Of course. Yes. <laughs> um, and that one's got the purple and white coloring that's really nice and would really go well in the garden. Yeah, definitely. Um, Complementing other colors. And then we've got Lady Thumb here, which I would say is my favorite of the bunch. It's just tiny and it's, you know, a double and it just almost got a little bit more of the classic fuchsia look, but it's really tiny. I'm not sure if you guys can see how small that is on TV. And a million blooms. I mean, there is a ton of blooms and all those buds to come next. It is covered. Yeah, it's covered. And so. you know, I've always heard that, you know, fuchsias aren't just for shade. So have you heard that you can put them in the sun too? I have heard that. Um, and you just need to plant them a little bit extra deep. So oh. they're one of the few plants that, you know, actually like to be planted a little bit deeper. Um, and then you're just going to have to really stay on top of the water because, okay. I mean, the fuchsias will tell you if they're not getting enough water. <laughs> you'll oh, know. You'll know what's wrong. So. And then also fertilizer this time of year? Yeah. Um, just They're big, heavy feeders. So um, I like liquid fertilizers. Um, we brought this one out, you know, as an example, but there's many that would work. Um, so this one's a high bloom fertilizer. Um, so just that works great. Yep, I love liquid fertilizers. It's kind of, you could definitely easy. see them working, you know, the next week. So do fuchsias need deadheading? Yes, oh. yeah, they really benefit from deadheading. Um, and actually here you can see, so here's the flower. There's a little seed pod right here. Um, this one's already fallen off. So when the flower dies, you actually want to pick off the seed pod um, because that's telling the plant that it needs to reproduce some more. So. Um, the energy is going back into new blooms opposed to, you know, energy into some old icky blooms. Right, and you don't want the seeds, you want them more flowers. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you have a special event going on today and tomorrow, so what's going on? Yeah, we've got the uh, Fuchsia Society here, they're having a show and sale. Um, so it's a really great way to come out and see all the different varieties. And if you have any questions, they're the people that are going to be able to answer them for you. Oh, that is true. It's so funny to have experts. Yes. That is great. So, you know, Portland Nursery on Stark Street is going to have this event. So go to GardenTime.tv and click over to the website. You can get the information on exactly when the Fuchsia Society is going to be here. But come out and get your questions answered and maybe pick up uh, some more Fuchsias. Thanks so much. Thank you. For our tip of the week, we have a great idea for you. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Huh? Now tell me what, what gardening tip is going to come from a kid's inflatable swimming pool. Uh, William, start blowing it up and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> William, that's enough, that's enough. Uh, well, it's not full yet. But you know, for this tip of the week, you only need a little bit of water to take care of the plants while we're on vacation. That's really true. Now here's what we think about this. You take it, you get a kid's pool, you put a couple of inches of water and that's all you really have to do. <laughs> Make sure that it's in the shade, and then while you're on vacation, there we go. Set the pots in. You know, this is just a great way while you're away to have them watered. You don't have to rely on your neighbors or friends down the block, and so sometimes they forget. So this one will be on duty 24 7. Using a child's little swimming pool to keep your plants healthy while you're on vacation, that's our tip of the week. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Hi, I'm Sarah with Portland Nursery, and I'd like to invite you to check out our website where you'll find valuable gardening information that you know is local to our area. Check out our gardening solutions page where you'll find over a hundred helpful brochures or sign up for our email newsletter to receive timely gardening advice, inventory updates, and upcoming classes and events. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. On 50th and Stark, 90th and Division.
Stop and smell a rose, hear a child laugh, see the beauty that is Oregon. You will find all this and more at the Oregon Garden in historic Silverton. 400-year-old oaks, edible landscapes, a children's garden. The Oregon Garden has something for everyone. You can ensure the garden remains a jewel in the mid Willamette Valley through your support as an individual, family, or corporate member. Support the garden that showcases the diverse botanical beauty of our state, the Oregon Garden. Why do the finest builders shop at Standard TV and Appliance? We've been partners with Standard for years. They really align with, with our mission because as a company, our mission is to provide the best quality customer service, customer care. Without that, I don't think our relationship would have lasted this long. Standard can make your dream kitchen a reality. Setting the standard since 1947. Standard TV and Appliance. Nothing is more inviting than a garden full of beautiful clematis. And your chance to see the Queen of Vines is at the Rogerson Clematis Garden at Lusher Farms. To learn more about the garden, get directions, or learn about garden events, go to rogersonclematiscollection.org. Well, Garden Time loves showing you projects from the wall. We've seen them many times over the years. Well, we have another one today. I'm with homeowner Heidi. Hi, Heidi. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. And thanks for inviting us here. You have a beautiful front garden. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. So we when, love it. I bet you do because it looks well used, well, well entertained in. Thank you. We're, we're going to have a, a great summer for entertaining coming up with the sun out. Excellent. So you had some challenges here when you moved in. So what were those challenges? Um, we had a yard that, um, as you can see from the street, it sloped down to the um, house. And there was a window that was about two to three feet above. Um, and I wanted to have it excavated out where we'd have usable space. The way it was, we couldn't even put a chair out in the oh. front yard. Oh. So it was totally unusable. And then you had a huge tree that we blocked a, everything. Yes, we had a huge blue spruce that we took out, and um, you could then see the house. But that was just the beginning. We needed a lot more work. And so what was the next step there? What did you do? Well, the next step was I called Jake uh, McCutcheon from the wall. I knew him because I'd had him as a student at Franklin High School. And, um, and I really enjoyed and liked the family a lot and thought if I ever had a project, I would call the wall. And he came right out. He told me, oh, yeah, 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 we can do this. We can do this. And then I said, I need to have some expertise on getting an actual plan. I wanted to make sure drainage was right. Mm. He picked up his phone. And he said, we have this landscape designer. We use him all the time. And he called Larry. And Larry was over at my house within 20 minutes. And we started the plan. Uh, we started the plan August of two years ago, and then um, st then we actually started the work last year in um, April, I believe, finished by June, and um, this is what there you see is. this year. So oh, It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Well, it is really a collaborative effort here, and so now I'm going to talk to Larry, who's the designer, and so you met with Heidi inside the house, which is interesting that you started there to talk about this. Well, it's always a good place to start is inside, because you can see the, the flavor and the flair of the customer, and just get comfortable uh, outside the project, and talks about their their uh, wishes and their hopes, and, and just... Uh, get comfortable and it just there she's so has so much color in her life that I just wanted to bring that from inside to outside and uh, and it was really nice uh, and so I could see that you put lots of color lots of plantings in and then you had to just pick some um, different materials for the patio and then for the wall yeah we like stamp concrete is a great option compared to pavers and it I think it's less maintenance than uh, pavers and the wall material is a uh, allen block courtyard stone. It's the same on both sides so then it, it looks, uh, you don't see the back of a wall um, in this application. Uh. We just uh, worked on some of the details with the drainage problems that mm. we talked about. This Everything sloped to the house. There was plants everywhere and, and a postage stamp of lawn and uh, and it was just nice to be able to flatten this area out, correct all the drainage problems, install a French door and bring the inside outside. Uh, well, you can really see that from that view from inside and lovely space to, to relax in and entertain. Well, Larry touched on some of the materials here that the wall used, but I'm gonna go talk to Jake and really get the details about that. 
Well, now I'm with Jake from The Wall, and Jake, you were actually the first contact for Heidi, and then you brought a designer in. That's correct, yeah. After kind of seeing the layout of the project here and her overall agenda and what she wanted to see, we figured it'd be best to bring in our designer, and that's Larry Borland, who you guys were just speaking to. Um, and he came up with this design, and it worked out fantastic. He uh -huh. really did a good job taking in the lighting and, you know, just everything she wanted to see. Yeah, and I see there's a lot of different textures here, so how important is that to a design? It's very important, very important. You know, we have all sorts of different types of retaining walls. This is right here, this is a segmental retaining wall. It's manufactured by Oregon Block and Paver. Um, it's called the Allen Block Courtyard. So when Heidi was saying she wanted to uh, kind of create a courtyard, I figured what a better product to use than the courtyard block. Uh, it's great for small retaining walls, and it also is uh, capable of being freestanding as well, which helps in this product. Uh, and I love this stamped patio. This is really lovely. Yeah, this is colored stamped concrete. Uh, we recommend this for all your patio areas. We don't really want it for driveways. That's why we have the uh, sand finish over uh -huh. there. Um, but yeah, it's uh, colored, and you're kind of kind of loose with what you want in the color there. We can kind of custom it a little bit. So were there any problems here that you had to solve? Uh, there was a few. The biggest was going to be the drainage. Mm. Uh, you know, we obviously came in, excavated down, so wow. with all the water that's going to be flowing, this is that's a big issue. So we ended up putting drainage behind the retaining walls and, uh, you know, trying to reroute all the water as best as possible. Um, obviously, when you're digging down this far, you're eliminating a lot of the area for the water to go, and it's just going to want to pool right in here, but we're used to that. Ah. We encounter that on almost every project. Oh, of course, of course. And so then once that was solved, how much longer with the project? Uh, it was about a three-week project. From wow. the time I broke ground uh, to the time we were all done, it was about three weeks, and then she was entertaining. Oh, that is nice. Was that great. was the main goal. That's it. <laughs> Got her what she wanted. So how can we contact you? How can we find you? You can get a hold of us uh, via uh, the internet at bythewall.com, or you can call us at 503-735-9255. Uh, so, you know, you can see this beautiful entertaining area that Heidi has now in the front of her house. It's the sky's the limit, whatever your creativity is, and the wall's creativity. So please go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to their website, and you can find out how you can have this at your house. Thanks so much, Jake. Thank you. Pleasure. We want to thank you for watching Garden Time today and say, William, I can help you pitch your tent. Oh, thanks, Judy. Oh, my goodness. Well, thanks, Judy. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now, if you do go camping and you miss the show, remember you can always catch it at gardentime.tv. William and I thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week here on Garden Time. Don't you just love all the things inside Garden Time magazine? So much great information about gardening. I do, William. There's new plants, adventures, recipes, local gardeners, home tips. And it's free, right in your email. But there's two things you left out. What's that? <laughs> you and me. <laughs> we write some of the articles and get to share our gardening knowledge. Of course, I should have. William, where did you go? Right here, Judy. You'll find both of us every month in Garden Time magazine. Sign up for your free subscription on the Garden Time website. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.